All right, uh, so today's lecture, we're gonna continue with tumor profiling. In the last lecture, we had Dr. Nadi Getz, who uh, gave a really comprehensive lecture on how to do tumor mutation profiles from high throughput sequencing, whether it's just sequencing the exons of genes or sequencing the whole genome and using um, mutation costs to figure out, you know, what are the mutation patterns, what they mean, and whether something are driver genes. Um, so actually within the big TCJ tumor uh, consortium, um, they profiled over 10,000 tumors and DNA sequencing is only one of the platforms. That's the very top you can see from mutation. Um, from the um, DNA sequencing, you could look at copy number, but most of the copy number variation profiles are actually done using microarrays to look at copy number changes. But in addition to that, they also did gene expression. They also did DNA methylation, microRNA expression, and um, uh, RPPA is a proteomics approach. And then they also have uh, some very basic clinical annotations, for example, patient age, um, gender, the tumor stage. Some of them have basic treatment and also uh, survival, at least in you know five, six years. And so these information are all available. And so this is a really comprehensive resource for us to look at tumor in a holistic view, not just from the mutation side. And so by this time, a TCGA project has already finished and there are 33 different tumor types and over close to about 11,000 tumors that are profiled. And uh, you know, today we're gonna talk about, um, in addition to the mutation cause, what are other interesting things you can look at um, in terms of these tumor profiles. Um, for the first two uh, modules of this course, we talk a lot about gene expression. I think the importance of tumor mutation is that they do influence gene expression. And so with um, TCGA, they also did tumor expression. In the very early days, they used just microarrays. Um, when the TCGA project was started, it was like over a decade ago. Initially, they did microarray and then they did a little shallower sequencing, but at the end, they just did deeper sequencing of all the samples. And so now we have good RNA-seq data for all of the tumors. Um, and uh, in terms of data analysis, you can imagine, um, you can look at the differential expression. This is just one example. Um, each column is one cancer type. The red is the tumor, the blue is the normal, and each dot is one sample. And you know, like if you just look at all the samples together, this is just for one gene expression, you can see uh, roughly how high is this gene expressed in the different tumor types, whether it's higher expressed in the tumor compared to the normal, and whether it's a difference in the uh, tumor stage, for example, from the primary tumor to the metastatic tumor and, and so on. Right? So that's the very basic analysis. You can imagine after you do differential gene expression, you can also run gene set enrichment analysis and things like that. Um, so with uh, many, many samples available, you can also look at the gene modules. This is um, when you have many different samples, you can do this. You can't just do this with just a tumor normal pair. Um, so this is called a WGCNA. It's a weighted gene co-expression network analysis. You can imagine um, if you have, say, one tumor type, mm, let's just think about like mm, luminal breast cancer in hundreds of samples at the same time, you profiled many, many patients, then you could look at genes that are correlated in many, many samples. And so in this case, um, they could see this very big cluster of genes that are correlated. And then there are smaller other gene groups that are correlated. And each might be enriched in a different pathway or some different functions. And you can use this to identify robust gene modules that are co-expressed um, in the many, many tumor samples together. Usually you do this, you know, cancer type by cancer type. Okay, so this, and then you can ask whether those group of genes are co-regulated in some similar ways. You can imagine um, looking at chip seq data or, or 
based on the genes in this module, you can run algorithms such as LISA to see what are the transcription factors that are really important in, the, in this type of um, gene modules. Okay. Um, another thing that was very useful is pathway enrichment. We mentioned that if you have differential gene expression, especially be between tumor normal, um, you can run gene site enrichment. Earlier in this course, in many homeworks, you have tried to run either a David or gene site enrichment. Um, but uh, sometimes, uh, if you have many, many samples, such as a cohort like TCGA, um, say in a long uh, adenocarcinoma cohort, you might have 300, 400 samples, and you want to probably see how often these pathways are differentially expressed in the different samples. And so for that, the Broad Institute now have this single sample GSEA. And basically, you have to first decide what type of pathways you are interested in. Remember for um, gene site enrichment, there are probably tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of different pathways. You can focus on looking, for example, only at metabolism related pathways or gene sets. Um, you can also look at immune related pathways. So you predefine the set of signatures you want to look at. And then um, the, the sing single sample GSEA, they have kind of some reference. You know, they, they, they probably look at many, many gene expression data together to establish that baseline. And then based on the expression profile, you observed in every single sample, it can be compared with this baseline, and then it can show you the level of um, gene set enrichment of this one sample in this one signature. So in this case, each column is one sample. You can see here it's patient 12, patient 11, or patient, yeah. so these are patients. Um, and then each row is one pathway or signature that's being displayed in here. So you can evaluate for a set um, pathways, how much it is present or absent, or how strong the signature is, is, of it, is present in these um, individual tumor samples. So that's kind of a, uh, a way for you to look at um, different samples to see how robust a particular signature is compared to the tumor versus normal or within different uh, tumor samples in the same cancer type, okay? So that's another way you can look at gene expression. So that's a little bit, you know, um, it, it kind of uses what we have learned earlier in the semester, but you can see there are many other tools that are developed to make this analysis even more meaningful when you really have many, many samples available. Um, another thing that people are very, very interested in is doing tumor subtyping. These are very uh, often, you know, in the early days, these are mostly done in pathology. And so you can imagine that this is in breast cancer. Many, many years ago, uh, breast cancer in path pathologists know that um, after you have a tumor uh, slide, it's good to stain for three different markers. Uh, one is estrogen receptor, one is progesterone receptor, and one is HER2. So these three receptors. And at that time, they, they know that if the patient has a estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor positive tumor, they have usually better uh, outcome of the patient and they should be treated with something. And with early days with um, HER2 positive breast cancer, in early days, these patients have very, very bad outcome until a HER2 antibody was therapeutic antibody was developed by Genentech. Um, it's called um, Herceptin. And patients with the HER2 amplified tumors, once it's treated with Herceptin, has much better survival. Not as good as the ER positive tumors, but it's still much better than without the Herceptin drug. And then there's another type, which um, in the early days, people knew if, if the patient had, it's called the triple negative. They are estrogen receptor negative, um, progesterone receptor negative, or HER2 negative. And so if these are triple negative breast cancers, they usually have much worse survival. And um, in 2001, this is even before um, RNA sequencing was available. It was using uh, microarrays to look at expression of thousands of genes. And people can already start um, dividing the tumors into subtypes. And you can see that 
in addition to the ER positive, HER2 positive, or triple negative S3 subtypes, um, they were able to use just basic hierarchical clustering to divide the breast cancer into more subtypes. Mm. So for example, there's a Lumina OA type, which is fairly frequent. Um, by the way, on the right side, you can see um, how often these type of subtypes really uh, occur in the population during in, in the early diagnosis. For example, in the primary tumors, about 40% of those are Lumina A subtypes. You can see here, these are also a bigger population. And then a um, smaller one is called the Lumina B. Um, it's 26%. It's still actually, I would say, quite abundant. And so between these two, you probably are talking about 60 to 70 percent of all the breast cancer cases, right? Um, and then there is, um, there's also, yeah, at that time there was Lumino C and a, a normal, normal like. This is uh, normal like is the uh, 13 percent in here. And then there's HER2 her positive, which is about 10 percent. And then there is 10 percent basal like. These are the traditionally what people call triple negative breast cancer, and these are usually pretty bad. And so based on years of people using either microarrays or RNA-seq, they, they can do the clustering um, and correlate with patient survival or, or pathology. Um, it, so scientists um, developed this panel called PAM50, basically using 50 genes as markers to decide whether a particular tumor belongs to luminal A, luminal B, HER2, basal-like, or, or normal-like tumors. By the way, this normal is not, is not real normal, it's normal-like. Um, they are still kind of a, a breast cancer type, but they usually have pretty good outcome. For example, if you look at the um, metastatic tumors, so these are you know patients, either they had a recurrence or um, at the time of diagnosis, the tumor has already metastasized. And so if you look at their subtyping using these 50 genes, and so by the way, the 50 genes are now um, FDA approved subtypes. Basically, when the patient goes to the clinic, um, they can use a simple assay just to look at the expression of these 50 genes to decide what subtype they belong to. And this will be covered by the medical insurance because depending on what subtypes they have, the patient will be treated with a different type of drugs and they will also know that they will have different um, type of outcome. And so you can see here the metastatic tumor compared to the primary tumor. You can see the primary tumor has much more luminal A, um, a little bit less of luminal B, but fewer um, HER2 or, or uh, basal-like. Whereas if you look at the uh, metastatic tumors, there are a lot fewer lumina, o, lumina A subtype because the lumina o A is a good, you know, good uh, uh, kind of slightly better outcome tumor. And probably the best is normal like. Because they are normal like, they kind of grow slower, they are less likely to metastasize. Um, it's probably in this order. Normal like is the best type. And then lumino A, lumino B, um, her too, I guess. You know, even though they, they do appear a lot in the metastatic tumors, you can treat the patient now with a drug, with a therapeutic antibody drug, which is a, a, a good sign. And, but then with basal or these triple negative breast cancers, the treatment options are much more limited and the patient will have overall worse survival. So you can see the subtyping are very important. The patient will be treated differently and they will have a different outcome. With, this is in the early days when people were only using uh, gene expression, but as we mentioned with TCG, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when you say uh, from metastatic tissue, do you mean like uh, this is DNA? This is like uh, DNA from the actual like metastatic tumor that like went to the lung or went to the liver, like went to the lung or went to the brain, or is it from patients that just have a metastasis in general? Uh, I, I I don't know specifically for this type, but you know, for example, sometimes when the patient have a surgery the doctor might already discover that the, the tumor has metastasized to the lymph node. 
Yeah. And then they could resect those tumors. And when they do this, it's not just DNA. Actually, for the subtype, it's done on the RNA, not on the DNA. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, is this like looking at the tissue from the lymph node, or is it looking still at like just a breast tissue from someone who has metastatic disease? It, it really depends on the sample availability. For example, okay. for melanoma samples, because it's on the skin, Usually, you can easily resect the metastatic tumor. But for example, if it's breast cancer metastasized to the liver, then patients usually don't want to be operated on. Even for biopsy, it carries risk for the patient. Okay. If it's from surgery and the doctor already see a lymph node metastasis, it's easy to just take it out. Right? Okay. So doctors usually do it. And so it really depends. Um, so in Tuesday's lecture, um, Dr. Gass mentioned that nowadays um, in the cancer research community, um, they are trying to get really early lung lesions, or sorry, early cancer lesions. But you know, you, you need to have early diagnosis as well, which is tricky. But at the same time, you also have, uh, they are, we are always interested in metastatic tumors because primary tumors don't usually kill patients. It's usually yeah. metastatic tumors. The difficulty there is, um, very often when the tumor are metastasized, especially for a distal metastasize, patients usually don't want to do surgery because just because uh, you see one metastatic uh, side, um, metastatic tumors usually go to tissues that have a lot of blood, you know, lung, liver, bones, and brains. And those places, it's hard, first of all, it's harder to operate on and it carries risk. And just because you don't see other potential metastatic site doesn't mean that they don't have those. And so just operate on one metastatic site would not help the other sites. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, so the only exception for that is a brain metastasize. For, for, uh, for example, um, if somebody have a lung cancer that's metastasized to, a lung, uh, to, to, the, to the brain, sometimes without operation, um, it could influence the patient breathing, it could influence the patient for balance, and depending on where, where that is in the brain, right? A patient may not be able to walk um, or, or they can't see anymore. And so most of the time, patients do not want their metastatic tumors to be operated on. The exception is when it's metastasized to the brain. And so actually uh, at, uh, uh, at MA, MGH, um, um, there, there are surgeons, uh, brain ca cancer surgeons, like uh, Dr. Um, Priscilla Bricianos, they were able to operate on the brain because they have to take it out for the patient's normal brain to function normally. Because if it's metastasized to the other organs, the organ can grow, but when it's in the brain, it, the skull limits the total size. And so the tumor can squeeze important other brain tissues. So they can't work well, right? So they can get the metastatic tissues to do more profiling and they are making really fantastic discoveries. Okay, so- I, have, I also have a question, sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, um, at, so I can see from this slide that tumor is really heterogeneous. And then, for example, when we are doing experiments, we normally would take a cancer cell line to try to model the, um, the like human cancer tag. So if we are using, like, say, a cancer cell line from a cancer cell line encyclopedia, and is it sufficient if we just try to um, um, plot the correlation between the, uh, for example, um, kidney cancer cell line with uh, all those uh, kidney cancer subtypes uh, in the TCGA uh, in terms of RNA-seq, which is gene expression, to show, like, um, which which, um, which human cancer type does this kidney cancer cell line best model? Or do we also have to consider um, like protein expression uh, mutation or DNA copy number changes um, and combine all those four indicators along with um, RNA-seq, which is gene expression to de determine which human cancer type does this specific cancer cell line can best model. So the question is whether cancer cell lines are representative. I guess we have two questions. One yeah. is uh, just because you get a cell line, 
from a breast cancer patient, then you can you know, propagate this. For example, the Broad Institute has a really big cell line encyclopedia. They have about 1,400 cancer cell lines now. How well does this cell line capture what happens in a primary tumor? Um, I would say it's only one representation. Um, I will show you later on uh, with you know, single cell, single cell uh, tumor profiling. Um, it's informative but it's not everything. Um, mm -hmm. This is one thing. In addition, what is useful information to profile? For example, that that's really a matter of cost, right? Broad Institute initially, when you have 1,400 cell lines, you do, um, they, they did uh, SNP arrays, they did RNA-seq, they did uh, like whole exome sequencing to look at the mutations. Recently, they, they, they just published a proteomics data for, for those cell lines, and they're doing CRISPR screen. So, um, every assay to do this consistently across many, many cell lines, there's a cost. And so um, the biologically, the cell line represents some of these tumors, but maybe not completely. So even for example, even with breast cancer, you can use the PAM50 to decide whether the cell line belongs to a luminal A or a basal. But even after that, it's only one type of basal out of you know maybe many different basal tumors, right? Is it? representative enough? Um, probably not. Uh, but also, what type of uh, profiling are informative? I think the more the better, but it's just a matter of cost. Can we afford to do so many? Or at least abroad, can they afford to do so many? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and so, for example, with um, TCGA, um, most of the samples have also gone through epigenetic profiling at that time they did a DNA methylation. In the early days, it was a different, micro, a different uh, DNA methylation array. Later on, all of the samples are profiled with this Illumina human uh, methylation 450 array. Very few samples were profiled with whole genome sequencing. You can see this uh, 450 array. It has um, this many number of uh, CPG uh, sites, and uh, it covers I think all the genes promoters, especially the CPG rich uh, CPG island promoter, and in the compared to the very early day arrays, that the newer ones also cover some on the gene body, on the enhancers, um, some in, in intergenic regions, um, and this really has been done. Um, all the tumor types, I would say most of the samples in those tumor types have DNA methylation readout. Um, recently, there are also efforts doing a whole genome bisulfide sequencing. Of, of course, this is very expensive because we have to sequence the genome um, many, many times over, right, in order to read out this. So this is only done on very limited numbers. And so what are the analysis you, know, you could do early on? Very easily, uh, we can check is you could look at whether the promoter um, a CP, if the, the promoter of the gene has a CPG island, you can see whether that CPG island is methylated. And if it is methylated, we will know that in this tumor, this gene is silent, it's not expressed. Um, and we can also see if the promoter is not methylated and also the gene body is methylated, that actually indicates this gene is highly expressed. Um, and recently, there are even more work looking at the DNA methylation on the enhancers. And those can be used to explore what transcription factors might be binding. Of course, what we know is that if it's methylated, it's probably not binding. But if it's unmethylated, it doesn't mean that it, it is binding. So it, it gives you some information, but not all the information. Um, when TCGA was available, um, actually, the, the community discussed whether we could do chip seek or some chromatin accessibility assays, but at that time, the technology was not ready, so it wasn't done. Recently, um, Howard Chang's lab at Stanford generated the attack seek data of about 400 TCJ tumors. It's not everything they picked representative tumors from each cancer type to do this type of profiling. And so with the attack seek data, now we can look at transcription factor uh, binding in many different cancer types much, much better now. Um, so that's a, but it's, it's not done as systematically as, you know, DNA, methyl, uh, DNA methylation or RNA sequencing or mutation analysis. Another profiling technique is uh, proteomics. Um, 
there are actually many different types of proteomics. You know, the, uh, one is mass spec, but, but those, um, I think, depending on how many proteins you want to detect, the cost is still quite different. What has been done for most of TCGA samples are these protein microarrays. Um, so by the way, these are two figures I, I found from Google image. Um, they, they both kind of explain what this uh, reverse phase protein microarrays are. Basically, when you have a, a tumor sample, and so, so in this case, um, each column is one tumor, and uh, you, you kind of take a small slice and you put it on the array, and they put three replicates in, in here. You see, these are replicates. Um, and you can also do the dilution initially. So you get the protein at a low level, at high level, and so this is one sample, and then this is another, uh, this is another tumor, this is another tumor, or what, another sample, basically. And so there's a dilution, there's also replicates. Um, and then with, with this, they, they have to generate many, many such arrays because, you know, you can see each tumor, you can take very thin slices of this to put on this um, protein microarray. And then um, for each array, um, you can have, you can put in many, many tumors in here. See, each block is one tumor. And, and then um, if we're interested in testing the expression of one gene, for example, uh, KRAS, I want to see how much KRAS ex is expressed or protein level is available on each tumor, um, you just put an antibody against that protein. And if the tumor is, is expressing high level of that protein, the antibody will bind strongly. Um, but in order to really detect that, later on we use another fluorescently labeled protein which will recognize other antibodies to bind to this. And then when you shine lights, those fluorescent antibody can give out lights of different colors. And so the really bright ones are the tumor samples that have high levels of the protein you're interested in. And so you can imagine for the same uh, similar slides, uh, you could you can either just wash them off and then test on another antibody, or you can take a different uh, tumor slice and try a different, different primary, like first antibody. So the first antibody detect the target you are interested in. The second antibody only help you detect how much the first antibody is on the array. And so at the end, um, you could know each tumor, how much they have for this type of, uh, for, for any, protein you have a good antibody for. And so for um, TCGA, they have, I think something like 300 different antibodies on proteins that, that they know are potentially interesting or, or, or useful to, to know. And so they, they also profiled thousands of samples and that data is also publicly available. And so now with all the data available, you wonder whether you can cluster them together. Um, and so for that, initially, when people were trying to cluster based on mutations, uh, you can imagine if you look at all the tumors with uh, HER2 mutation, they don't always cluster well uh, as uh, what you get from cluster based on uh, RNA. Um, but if you cluster based on microRNA, it also gives you a different clustering. If you cluster based on DNA isolation, it also gives you a different uh, clustering approach. And so at the end, um, recently people are using um, consensus clustering. Uh, you can imagine, uh, re remember consensus clustering is um, initially um, you can just take a subset of those genes. Um, and also take a subset of the tumors, and then you try to do uh, k-means clustering, and then you ask, do two tumors get clustered together, a co-occurrence matrix, whether they belong to the same cluster, and if so, you write a one in there. Um, next time, you, you sample another group of genes, and you sample another group of tumors, you do clustering again, and you do this co-occurrence again, and if two, gene, uh, two tumors are, are again within the same cluster, you write to your co-occurrence matrix again. But you can also, so initially, you know, people use this to look at what genes are, or what tumors are robustly co-clustered uh, in, in the same, uh, same group. But you can imagine you can use the same approach to combine different profiling techniques 
So for example, sometimes you can do clustering with just whole exome data. Sometimes you, you can do clustering with RNA-seq data, with microRNA data, with DNA methylation data. And then you just ask how many of those tumors are, are always together, regardless of what platform you have. And this way, at the end, you can get, hopefully, better uh, clustering result. So you can see here uh, from the top, um, you know, this is from the RPPA, this generates some subtype. Uh, this is uh, breast cancer. Um, you can look at the ER and PR status. You can see actually these two are kind of correlated. HER2 is a distinct cluster. You can also look at pathology, um, you know, how well they, they you know, looking at, let's say, tumor size, you know, how well you stain the tumor or you know, other, depending on what markers you use. Um, and this is using mRNA expression. This is using mutation status and try to look at um, whether you can cluster them together. And so, um, you know, with more data, potentially, you can cluster the results even tighter. But then, of course, there are maybe some tumor samples, they're just oddball, look very different from others, right? And so, I mean, the reason we are very, very interested in knowing about the subtype is because depending on the subtypes, the patient will be treated differently. They will also have potentially different survival. Okay, so that's, that's why people are interested. There are many, many resources available on tumors, um, especially on TCGA. So for example, with TCGA, uh, the Broad has a, a fire hose, and University of Chicago has this uh, GDC, uh, Genomics Data Common, has a lot of the tumor-related resources. And actually from the GDC, you can download the raw data from the TCGA, and as well as process the data. Um, the CVAL portal is something that I, I think homework six, you will play with the, the data there. Um, this has all the process data, but it has really user-friendly visualization tools that you can use. Yeah, UC Santa Cruz um, has some resource that also collected the TCGA data, allowing to do, um, you can access both the raw and process data, but also there are um, APIs allowing you to do a data analysis on the server. And University of Michigan has Oncomine, which has um, many other non-TCGA cohorts. They are collected from individual studies you can look at. And also there are, you know, Sanger has this Cosmic, which has all the catalog, a catalog of all the mutations in cancer and annotations for those, which are very, very useful. Okay. Questions? Yeah, I have a few questions. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so is there any um, resources for like mouse? Bulk RNA seq data. Mm, that's a good question. Like uh, most, people. that I'm not aware of. It's a really okay. good question. Yeah, the, you know, because you can imagine the tumor in the mouse. There are, are many different possibilities. Whether yeah. it's a wild type mouse, whether it's a, a genetically induced tumor, or it's a spontaneous tumor, or whether it's a human tumor that's grown in the mouse. You know, whether the mouse have immune systems. So mm. it's very complicated. I'm not aware of a good database with those collections, but you know, let me know if you know of any. Okay, okay. And also another question is uh, for your previous slides that you introduced the TCG I cluster, which can is a multi-omic, um, like integrative techniques. So, is there any like algorithm that you can detect, uh, for example, each tumor subtype specific upregulated gene cluster, like in using the I cluster. Yeah, so after you, 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 you divide the genes, in, sorry, the, the samples into yeah. clusters, then you can just do regular differential gene expression. Do regular differential gene expression. Yeah. But uh, I mean, like, for example, if you cluster all those um, cancer panels in TCGA into, for example, 18 clusters, and if you're going to detect uh, what are the gene sets that are uniquely differentially in, expressed in each, uh, each um, cluster, then you have to do pairwise test, which you're going to do like choose, choose two from 18, mm. which will be like 153. It's a good question. So within TCJ, they don't try to really compare different cancer types. Okay. Uh, the the p potential reason uh, is there are too many differences between say, a brain cancer versus a lung cancer. Besides, um, with TCGA, all the brain cancers are profiled at one site. Mm. 
-hmm. all the lung cancers are profiled at the different sites. And so some of those differences could also be because of batch effect, you know, these are different uh, sequencing center. And so they don't try to do that. Usually the subtype is within the cancer type. For example, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Over a thousand breast tumors are all profiled at the same place. And when they do subtype, you know, for, with breast tumor, usually people just do like four to five. For that, you can, you know, you, you can do yeah. differential expression analysis. Okay. And um, another small question. Can I go back to your slides on SSGC? Uh, Yes. Yeah. So is this um, uh, like the previous one? Like, uh -huh. the yeah. So is this the um, co-expressed co network, the module, G module, if you're going to annotate with uh, like the annotation package you loaded, it will lead to like the GC is the same thing as GC if you just annotate those co-expressed G modules. You mean GC, you mean differential expression? Yeah, so I mean, I think, if I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So if, uh, from my understanding, I mean, like GC is just you annotate from the annotate package you're loading and to those co-expression or co-expression gene modules, right? Yeah, so, so it depends on what you have. For example, you can imagine with the broad the CCLE 1400 breast cancer cell lines. Mm -hmm. You could use it to look at it. Uh, so I would say for tumor samples, people have been using WGCNA to look at gene modules. But if you go to two lectures from now, thinking mm -hmm. about the tumor immunology, you will know that this type of analysis, depending on the tumor microenvironment, may or may not give you all the correct biological uh, meaningful clusters, but also it depends on what you feed the, feed the algorithm. You can imagine if you give it all 1,000 breast cancer versus just all the luminal, luminal A breast tumors, it will give you, you know, how, how um, kind of a coarse grain versus fine grained clusters. Right? Because if you just give it all of uh, breast cancer, yeah, it will give you pretty much the subtypes. But if you yeah. only give it the, the tumors with one subtype, it will probably give you more expression correlated genes that are related to that subtype. Okay, thank yeah. you. But I can tell you later on, this is quite confounded by some of the immune genes in there. Okay. That's related to two lectures from now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to stop recording.